This is the story of how Dior was made, a prominent label founded by the French designer Christian Dior, who, despite his father's wish against an artistic career, went from rags to riches and riches to rags several times until he could turn Dior into one of the most significant names that ring a bell with most people around the world today. His father, Maurice Dior, was a wealthy man who wanted Christian to become a diplomat. However, due to respective deaths of his mother and brother along with the Great Depression, things got out of Maurice's hands. So from 1937 up to the time he was summoned to serve as a soldier, Christian worked for Robert Piggott, who is now known as Dior's trainer. After military service, he began working in Lelong's fashion house where he designed dresses for the Nazi officers' wives. Meanwhile, his sister was incarcerated in Nazi persecution camps. So, his popular perfume fragrance was named Miss Dior in her honor. It was Paris, 1946. Marcel Boussac, a wealthy businessman, invited Christian Dior to design for Philippe Augustin a prestigious Paris couture house. Christian Dior, who was then 41, had always had an artistic spirit. From dropping out of school to selling his fashion sketches for only 10 cents each, to opening an art gallery in later years and selling artworks by the likes of Pablo Picasso. Dior had always wished to be involved in art. He had been employed by early fashion designers such as Robert Piguet and Lucien Lelong during World War II. However, when he heard Boussac's offer, he refused it, since by that point he was ready to launch his own label under his own terms rather than resurrecting an old brand. Boussac welcomed this idea and financially backed him up. So the House of Dior was established on December 16, 1946 at 30 Avenue Montaigne in Paris. Dior's first collection was a spring-summer collection that was launched on February 12, 1947 at the company's headquarters. With this debut collection, Dior revolutionized France's fashion industry, and everybody was in awe. The collection went down in fashion history as the new look and became a trademark. It was welcomed as a refreshing antidote to the austerity of wartime and defeminizing uniforms. The collection showcased more stereotypical feminine designs in contrast to the popular fashions of wartime with full skirts, tight waists and soft shoulders. Dior preserved some of the masculine aspects as they continued to hold popularity throughout the 1940s, but he also wanted to apply a more feminine touch. It was glorious. The new look brought back the spirit of haute couture in France and other countries. Haute Couture is the creation of exclusive custom-fitted high-end fashion design that is constructed by hand from start to finish. Dior gained a number of prominent clients from Hollywood and among the European aristocracy. If you have watched Alfred Hitchcock's Stage Fright, you must know Christian Dior was the exclusive designer for Marlene Dietrich's costumes in the film. Ava Gardner's outfit in The Little Hut were also designed by Christian Dior. However, the new look was objected to as well. After years of clothes rationing through the war, some regarded that amount of fabric consumption as wasteful. Feminists in particular were insulted. They believed that these corseted designs were restrictive and regressive, and that they took away a woman's independence. Even Dior's fellow fashion designer Coco Chanel remarked, only a man who never was intimate with a woman could design something that uncomfortable. Despite all the opposing views, the new look remained highly influential, continuing to inspire the work of other designers well into the 21st century. Upon revolutionizing the fashion industry, Dior embarked on transforming the perfume industry as well. Elegant garments needed elegant fragrances to supplement the touch. Christian Dior Parfums was established in 1947. The launch of the first perfume, Miss Dior, was a huge success. It was named Miss Dior in tribute to his sister, Catherine Dior, who had served as a member of the French resistance during the war. She was captured by Gestapo and sent to concentration camp until her liberation in May 1945. With the establishment of a luxury ready-to-wear house in New York in 1948, Dior's empire started expanding. This was Dior's first boutique overseas. 
In 1950, Jacques Roux, the general manager of Dior, devised a licensing program to place the new renowned name of Christian Dior, visibly on a variety of luxury goods such as neckties, hosiery, lingerie, gloves, furs and jewelry. Some condemned licensing as a degrading move for the haute couture. However, it soon became a profitable act and began a trend which all couture houses followed for decades to come. By the end of 1953, Dior was represented globally. As popularity of Dior goods grew, so did counterfeiting them, which was highly supported by those who could not afford the luxury goods. Before his death in 1957, Christian Dior launched many highly victorious fashion lines, but none came as close to the profound effect of the new look. He died of a heart attack on 24th of October 1957. After the death of Christian Dior, Yves Saint Laurent, a 21-year-old prodigy, became the creative head at the House of Dior. Before Dior's passing, Saint Laurent was introduced to him by Michel de Bronoff, who was then editor-in-chief of the French edition of Vogue magazine. Saint Laurent's designs kept Christian Dior's legacy alive by keeping the same fabrics and silhouettes, so his were characterized as softer, lighter, and easier to wear than Dior's. However, his Bohemian collection in 1960 was harshly criticized. At the same time, he was called up for military duty and was forced to leave Maison Dior. This came as a relief to Dior's management. Following Saint Laurent's departure, Marc Bohan came to rescue the firm and took over the creative reins of the house. He launched the first Christian Dior home clothing line. At the same time, Christian Dior Cosmetics was also born. The first non-Frenchman to become a head designer at Dior was the Italian-born Gianfranco Fer. This sparked some controversies among Dior's management. It was 1989, so Fer decided it was time to leave behind the traditional Dior's aesthetics of romance and flirtation and introduced a new style concept described as refined, sober and strict. His audacious talent was very well received. He became the head designer for Haute Couture, Haute Fourure, women's ready-to-wear, ready-to-wear furs and women's accessories collections. By 1999, Dior's revenue rose to 177 million US dollars, with a net income of 26.9 million dollars. John Galliano was the second non-Frenchman to be appointed as the house's head designer. He was British. This choice was once again considered controversial, but Dior's chairman, Bernard Arnold, compared Galliano with Christian Dior himself in his spirit and aesthetics. Arnold believed he had the same mixture of romanticism, feminism, and modernity in his style as Monsieur Dior. Galliano's collections were also considered somewhat controversial, which resulted in a positive response and invoked further interest in the brand. For instance, his homeless show featured models dressed in newspapers. He followed Gucci's footsteps in the porn chic aesthetic and its erotic style and transformed Dior into something sexier. Galliano revolutionized Dior with this new styling concept. By the year 2000, it was time to revive Dior's menswear, the line which was originally founded in 1970 but was deserted because it was not at all as successful as the women's wear line. So a modern masculine aesthetic was brought to Dior Alm this time. And worn by Brad Pitt and Mick Jagger, the label gained notable male clientele as well. The entrance of watches into Dior's collection of fine jewelry was made by launching Le D de Dior, designed by Victoire de Castellan. Nevertheless, 2011 was a public relations nightmare year for Dior, and the house descended into chaos. The news made international headlines that John Galliano had made some anti-Semitic remarks. Consequently, Galliano was fired right before the debut of his fall-winter 2011 collection, which went ahead with him. From then on, Dior has had its ups and downs to regain its success. As it continues to evolve and flourish, as the fashion industry changes rapidly, it tries to keep the legacy of its founder, Christian Dior. After all, it's a brand rooted in history and has remained a leading company at the top of fashion's hierarchy for over 70 years. Now that you're here, don't miss our video on how Gucci was made.